My name is Cathy Caton, and I'm the founder of Brighton Gin. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Brighton Gin, first of all, see me afterwards. Uh, and secondly, uh, we make multiple award-winning, genuinely handcrafted gins, we'll come back to that description later on, uh, from our distillery in the glorious seaside city of Brighton and Hove. We're a friends and family team, and we've been on the go for 10 plus years, going through every growing pain imaginable, and no doubt with many, many more to come. Now, as we heard earlier, uh, terms like small batch, artisanal, you know, they're not, they're not defined. Anyone can slap them on a bottle, but that's one of the things I want to touch on over the next few minutes. We've grown from a kitchen table enterprise that's been bootstrapped since day one to a company that's exporting to 15 countries and counting, uh, which sounds amazing, by some measures, but be under no illusion, it's been an absolute slog. Now, bear with me, will the technology work? Ah! <laughs> different hair, different times. Um, so, I wanted to give you an idea of, of scale. Uh, this is me setting up uh, the imaginatively titled Still Number Three, uh, which was our workforce for years, setting it up on the first day that we moved in under the Urchin Pub in Hove. That was our third premises that we moved into. Don't move distilleries. Don't move them six or seven times either. Um, and as you can see, with me and the kitchen roll there for scale, uh, it was a tiny, tiny still. Uh, still number one, fact fans, was, uh, was basically a glass chemistry set that I bought off eBay and I managed to shatter it almost entirely. Still number two was a 10 litre alembic, alembic that totally looked the part, uh, but after a fall onto a concrete floor, wasn't. Um, <laughs> So I want to be really, really clear that I absolutely, basically come to praise Charles, not to, not to bury him. Uh, the years of expertise, knowledge and skill that he and his team have are truly outstanding. I've got so much respect for him and their skills with their liquids, the drinks development, everything that they bring to it. I've got hundreds of years of experience, not calling you old Charles. <laughs> Collectively, let's say. But, you know... If there are many ways to skin a cat, there are even more to make a gin. But before we get to the answers, let's probably look at some of the questions. You know, you've got the how, what, where, when, but absolutely the most important has to be the why. And it's all about the why. You know, why are you doing this? Why do you want to make gin? What's your motivation to do it? What's your driving passion? Are you after the mythical crock of gold at the end of the gin rainbow? And my tip on that one is that unless you're starting with a crock of gold, it's going to take a long, long time to get there, if at all. What do you want to do? You know, is this a stepping stone to help your cash flow ahead of releasing whiskey or other aged spirits? Is it gin and gin alone? Is it a combination of the two? What is it that you want to get out of it? How much time, love and money do you have to dedicate to it? And do you want to dedicate to it? Is it a part-time side hustle? Do you want it to be a full-time gig? In a world of 6,000 gin brands, and probably another 10 will have launched by the time I finish speaking, really, really think about the why. Not only why you are doing it, but why should a consumer or a drinker choose you, particularly when they and all of us are staring down the barrel of a cost of living crisis. Now, as someone who makes a locally identified gin brand, and I always wanted it to be called Brighton Gin from the very first light bulb moment of thinking of it, it's been really important to me personally that it's absolutely made in the town where it's born and bred. And for me, that's about authenticity. And this is where I'd like to have a mild rant, and possibly a word later on with Joe, about some locally identified gins that a contract distilled, but go to great lengths to hide that from their consumer by claiming that every drop is made in their garden shed to their grandfather's recipe with ingredients that they foraged that morning. You know, there is absolutely no shame at all in getting your product made by one of the world's best distilleries with generations of experience. But please do not pretend that you're making every drop of it by hand in your shed. It is absolute bollocks. And I really feel it's misleading the consumer, actually, and that they deserve better. Anyway, mild rant aside, the point that I want to make is that DIYing, and genuinely DIYing, is hard, expensive graft, but it can also be fantastically rewarding. And the story and authenticity can really help you connect with the consumer. It all comes back to what you want to do and why. So without doubt, I think that contract distilling can help you get something made and released to market so much quicker. 
It took me something like two years for me to get the recipe and the process, that really important process bit, for Brighton Gin right. Then if you add into that all of the wrangling with all of the known knowns and the unknown unknowns and the knowns unknowns, etc., HMRC, licensing, environmental health, fire safety, let alone developing that delicious, repeatable recipe. You know, you need to pass due diligence checks with potential suppliers. You need to vet them as well. Finding a space to work out of in, for me, what's now one of the most expensive cities in the UK, you know, finding customers to buy it, heck, at the end of it, the list very, very much goes on. But, like I say, I really wanted to make Brighton gin. And bringing the first legal distillery to Brighton was something I really, really wanted to do. When we were first starting, we actually had quite a few people uh, tell us what a crap name it was. Who would want to buy a regionally identified gin? Not said that delicately. Um, but looking at my gin shelf at home, you know, there are fantastic gins that are now global players, whether it's Cotswolds, John Shambo, Manly, and let's also not forget hundreds of years of Plymouth gin. I know that that was the right choice. I know, too, that I'm giving lots of conflicting messages. I think I'd just quite like to do that. Um, I'm unbelievably proud of what we've done with building Brighton Gin, but I also want to be really, really clear of all of the challenges that abound. So we're in the middle of moving into premises number six. Uh, the days of the kitchen table in my tiny flat are a long time ago, although I'm still in the tiny flat, because that previously mentioned crock of gin gold. Again, let's discuss afterwards. Um, but, you know, the amount of time and effort involved in moving distilleries just can't be overstated, and I really, really don't recommend it, if you can possibly avoid it. This is just to give you, first of all, something different to look at, uh, but also this is the team last year in, in our kind of Christmas flurry. We're plainly popping at the seams in our current distillery, hence yet again going through a move. Uh, despite, I really clearly remember promising I would never, ever do it again, and I wouldn't make the team ever do it again. Anyway, there we go. Um, I'm sure that there's a basic rule of physics about expanding to fit all available space. There it is, and I've done it time and time again. I think, too, it's probably worth mentioning about what a, and to state the utterly bleeding obvious, but what a turbulent time our sector has had over the past few years. You know, just as the on-trade market is dusting itself off after the battering of the pandemic, uh, the industry is now beset on all sides by challenge, as you really, really well know. You've got inflation, supply chain, hell, market saturation, recruitment, and of course the risk of declining sales as the cost of living crisis bites and people are forced to make new and different choices about how they spend their money. So I don't want to fundamentally depress anyone, uh, but I do want to be realistic. Uh, and I think, actually, a lot of the risks are mitigated through contract distilling. But, again, contradicting myself, you know, authenticity in what we do and the emphasis on building an ethical brand based on sustainable production methods, it's not only fundamental to how we are as people, how the team are, uh, but it's also become a key brand and marketing message. Again, in a world of 6,000 gins, why should someone choose us? We can't. And don't, um, I don't think we'll ever be able uh, to compete on price. But we are about quality, coming back to what Rachel was saying earlier, uh, an amazing gin with a great backstory and a fantastic team. Also, it's obviously bloody cold in that distillery. They look freezing. Um, just for a change of scene again. So whether you have a two or a 200 year history, I think what's important is knowing what customers want from your brand, sticking with that over the long term and knowing why you're doing what you're doing to keep yourself motivated through those 14-hour days which never ever seem to go away. So there's obviously still going to be demand uh, for alcohol in both the on and the off trade but with the majority of people finding their cash being squeezed I think that consumers will be becoming more discerning, want reassurance that putting their hard-earned quids on your product is going to be money well spent. And the level of Education in consumers is absolutely amazing too. I'm sure you've all had a similar experience, but you know, but about six years ago, a lot of the conversations at samplings were about how and why you should even approach tasting a gin neat. Uh, now at events, people come up and ask us directly if we make our own gin or not. Where's the distillery? What are the botanicals? What's the process? And it's an amazing thing to be able to talk about the distillery and to talk about the team, to explain that our 79-year-old production manager, Jude, a.k.a. my mum, um, has hand-labelled and filled all of these bottles. I also made a stand in the sea, and this is in October. It just looked nice and, nice and sunny, but 
that was literally taking one for the team. Thanks, Jude. Um, but we get to talk about you know, our community engagement and our sustainable production. Anything that helps people connect with us and our brand, and so much of that is through the story as well as the authenticity, and on a backbone of brilliant, brilliant gin. And I think we need to leverage that connection with people as much as we can, uh, much as I'd love it. We don't have a hefty marketing budget as such, by which I mean at all. So we need to be creative and resourceful about how we get our brand messaging out there. So to conclude, if you're starting up, and I probably should have asked and had a show of hands about if anyone is, is starting up in here, you know, it can be incredibly difficult and expensive to get your brand out there and get noticed. It's a really different landscape from when I was starting all those gazillions of years ago with the long hair that wasn't grey. For us, being able to talk about being Brighton born and bred, to have started the first distillery down there and to share the story of our team and our growing pains, our continuing growing pains too, have been a really key part of our brand building. We're incredibly proud of what we've done, but it absolutely hasn't been the quickest or the easiest route. Taking into account, too, the previously mentioned hurdles of licensing or health and safety requirements and legislation, and those exist for very, very good reasons, and they are not something to cut corners on, you know, there are definitely quicker and easier routes than the ones that we've taken. But whatever path you take, Make sure you know the why you are doing it, because you're going to need to have something to motivate you through it, through it all. And welcome to the brilliant, boozy, eccentric, well-dressed community of gin. Long may it rain. I look forward to seeing you in the bar later on. Thank you.